Hello, everyone. I'm here to talk about mess. No, I'm here to talk about the Eurovision Song Contest 2023, all three big nights for it. Everything about last week, the semifinals, the grand final, everything in between, because I haven't shared my thoughts on any of it yet. If you keep up with my channel, you'll know that I have talked about my predictions for semifinal one and semifinal two, as well as my thoughts on the automatic big five qual qualifying countries plus the host country, Ukraine, which of course got the free pass this year after having won the contest last year, though unable to host due to the war, being in the UK, the second place finisher last year, taking up the mantle of hosting duties this year in Liverpool. Uh, and first of all, I do want to say I have been to Liverpool. It is, I mean, as far as England cities go, it's not the most exciting place, uh, but it is is an interesting city full of character. Um, it's one of the first, one of the only hosting cities of Eurovision I've actually been to. Um, the others being Stockholm and Oslo. So uh, I think that uh, Liverpool is actually really close to where some of my relatives live in the UK. So it's just kind of cool to see that at Neck of the Woods gets so much of a spotlight. And apparently Liverpool gets 10 out of 10s for hosting. They did a phenomenal job. The city was just so involved and welcoming, promoting it everywhere you turned. You were seeing posters for it. Everywhere was just so happy and celebratory, which, you know, if you know the UK and their attitude towards Eurovision, particularly in the 21st century, you'd be almost a little surprised. But Sam Ryder really did change mindsets in the UK around Eurovision. And that's an amazing feat because prior to 2022, England, uh, the UK was on a real downward trajectory and not just in their placements in the grand final, but also in public attitude towards the contest overall. But of course, the UK didn't actually end up mimicking Sam Ryder's success this year. They really struggled, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about all that. But first, we got to talk about semifinals. Uh, we got to talk about semifinal one, which was last Tuesday, so like a literal week since I'm film week since I filmed this, since I'm currently filming this. But I decided to roll all my thoughts into one video. It's just easier for me that way. It's how I've done it the last couple of years. Um, 15 songs competed. And as we all knew, it was going to be the one to really watch. If you had to skip one semifinal, it was going to be semifinal two. Semifinal two had a lot of the duds. Semifinal one had all the stars. We had Laureen. We had Karia. We had um, Vesna, Mimi Cat. Pasha, Parfeni, just all the acts that I think people, were, Noah, Kirel, all the acts that people were more jazzed and excited about on average were in semifinal one, which made it a lot more of a competitive semi. And if you've watched my semifinal one predictions video, you know that it was the one I was more nervous to watch because there were several acts I was worried that would fall through the cracks. But I can say, looking at the results, I was pretty relieved when we finally got our announcements of who qualified, to be completely honest with you. I wasn't surprised at all. There was only one country that I felt could have deserved to go through that didn't, and that was the Netherlands. The Netherlands was the only country I felt got snubbed out of semifinal one. And I know that some people might have felt that Malta was another deserving qualifier. Again, if Malta had been in semi two, I think they might have had a better shot and you could have made that argument. But I think stacking up against the other 14 songs Malta was competing against I don't think what they were bringing to the table was worth qualifying. I'm sorry. I, I really would have hated to see any of those other songs take its spot. Another one that is a bit of a shame to not go through is Latvia. I will say that uh, Latvia, uh, unfortunately, you know, I feel so bad for the country. It's really struggled to qualify over the last five to six years. I believe their last qualification was in 2016. So it's quite a while ago. <laughs> They've been really struggling. Um, I've seen some people talk about this in the context of countries that have struggled to qualify for quite some time, whether they might consider just quitting altogether. Latvia has participated ever since they joined, like about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, but they've just not really had any luck. Um, although Latvia did, of course, win the contest in 2002, which is something Lithuania cannot say it's done, even though Lithuania has a lot more qualifying success. It's kind of interesting there. Um, Estonia has a lot better success with qualifying as well, and they actually have won before as well, though not for a deserving song. I'll get to that in my Eurovision winners ranking video. But Sudden Lights, Aya, is a tough one for me because I'll be honest, I really did struggle to fully embrace this song. If you watched my initial ranking of all 37 songs, I wasn't having 
an immediate response to it. I felt as though the song was very middle of the road. And if it didn't qualify out of the group we had in semifinal one, I just didn't feel like it again, if it had been in semi two, there are several songs in semifinal two that I would have happily seen go to let Latvia in. But when we're looking at semifinal one, I'm just not entirely sure that it had a spot. But I will say, I will say, and this is where I get controversial, and you know I like to be controversial, so prepare yourself for lots of controversy, lots of spicy hot takes. I am probably the only gay Euro fan who does not understand the hype around Serbia this year. Um, I absolutely loved Incorpore Sano last year. Constrada really did the damn thing. Um, and as inaccessible as that song was, it was still very immediate for the audience. I think the audience didn't have a hard time getting into it, even if they had no idea what she was saying or what the song was about um, or the, you know, atypical structure of the melody. They just, they were able to sort of fall in love with the whole package, but also still get a very clear vocal, um, kind of very concise choreography, a tight package. Luke Black with Samo Misispava always felt a little too chaotic for me. And I also think his vocal was just never quite going to rise above the mix of the bombastic production that he chose to accompany his voice with. It's definitely a choice for a song that, you know, probably would have benefited from a less is more approach in certain areas of production to completely swallow up his vocals. And I do think there might have been some audio issues. I was watching the Peacock stream of this contest, which by the way, can I shout out to NBC for not giving us Johnny Weir this year. I don't know if it was just me, but I was fully expecting Johnny Weir to return with commentary like he did last year. But no, we got it like 2021 when we had no commentary. Uh, as an American Eurovision fan, we're actually in a pretty good spot with Eurovision in that we don't have to listen to anyone talk over any of the postcards or any of the other hosts um, during the finals be and semis because other countries have to deal with that with their broadcasters. For example, Graham Norton with the BBC and such. It's kind of nice not having that. So it's really nice to just watch the contest and not have someone blabbing on, some, some gay blabbing on about it, you know, good for them. But it's like, you know, we don't need your commentary or your your cringe jokes at the contest, you know, taking a, taking a piss, you know, we get it. Um, you know, Johnny Weir is great. And I don't think he did a horrible job last year with the NBC presentation, but I was just, I was very kind of, I wanted to mention that. I was like, this is, this, especially since I had read somewhere that he was going to be back. Um, of course, I must admit, I do side eye Peacock making it the premium package. You can't get it for free like you can with some things on Peacock. You have to spend $5 at least a month, but you can cancel after that month. So it's only $5 to watch Eurovision live and replay, which isn't too bad. Anyway, going back to uh, whatever it was I was talking about, Serbia. The reason why I think Serbia didn't really hit for me is the fact that it's a lot of visual and it's a lot of great ideas that just don't come together in a cohesive package that feels sloppy. It feels like he's not really sure what he's doing on stage, especially once we get to the middle part, middle act and beyond. The opening with him laying in this contraption is probably the most engrossing and most put together part of it. But then the devolved sort of choreo that's somewhat, somewhat improvised feeling and the overwhelming light effects and sound effects, I don't think it's really going to resonate well with the audience. And so I'm just like sitting here like I am not surprised whatsoever that Serbia did not get an overwhelming televote. Um, I'm also not surprised that the juries were not really having it either. That was something I definitely did not expect the juries to like. Um, and I'm all for, you know, juries being a little bit more fair to avant-garde acts. But uh, this was not a case where I think even if I was someone who appreciated out-of-the-box music, I would have thought, you know, maybe the studio cut works, but this vocal is just really underwhelming. And the total package here is just not really working, not really working. It's not telling a story in any sort of way that I find is going to be grabbing to an audience. It's just... It's just gimmick for gimmick's sake. That's how it feels. Um, and 
unfortunately, you know, crazy other oddball acts like Croatia are able to capitalize on doing a little bit of a better job at succinctly, I don't know, um, bottling up their madness and putting it out on the stage. I'm not surprised that Croatia did far better in the televote than Serbia did. Um, even though, again, Serbia didn't bomb the televote, um, but Serbia definitely did not get what I think some people were hoping for. It was not an incorpore sano moment, um, which was, you know, really heartfelt to see Is Serbia getting in the top five last year because of the, the televote was phenomenal. Um, so Luke Black qualifying, to be completely honest with you, if Latvia had a spot, I mean, I would have taken Serbia's spot, which I know is hugely controversial, but I'd rather see the emotive, you know, pained, wonderfully vocalized performance that, uh, Sudden Lights is giving us over the kind of manic, disjointed mess that kind of is what Luke Black's giving us. I mean, don't get me wrong. I... I've really tried with Serbia's entry, but I don't know. I'm, am I alone here and just feeling like it's overhyped? <laughs> um, yeah, so I I, um, I feel bad for Latvia, and I definitely could have seen Latvia get in there. The Netherlands is tricky because I understand why it didn't qualify. I do. I, I think that Dion and Mia perhaps we're not engaging enough with the audience. They were having an insular moment on stage. And I actually really liked the idea of the rotating plinth and them sort of taking a little bit of a 70s disco uh, outfit choice to a song that feels a lot more sort of 90s alternative Britpop. And you know that I love the song. You know that I think Burning Daylight is a hell of a tune with a really emotional undercurrent, um, just reading the lyrics uh, and, and getting the story coming across with it. I, I was fully engrossed with it. And um, Switzerland was going to be its biggest competition and Switzerland ended up going through. And I'm not surprised. I think that Remo Fore, Forer just really knocked it out of the park with his vocals. I mean, his, his execution, the staging was really well considered, very high, well, very well crafted. Everything felt purposeful. Um, I, Water Gun exceeded expectations. And I think there was a lot of controversy around Dion and Mia and whether they had really the right chemistry together. They had been put together for the song. They hadn't met each other before they sang it together. Um, and, uh, you know, Duncan Lawrence, who was sort of the, uh, the person who set them up, possibly was losing faith in them as well. And that was spiraling out into the media. And so it became like the Netherlands is not really feeling confident. That's the narrative we're, we're, we're taking with us going forward. But from what I can gather, Dion and Mia had their best performance out of all the rehearsals and any pre-parties that we had seen on that stage in semifinal one. So I'm glad that for the moment where it really mattered, they, they pulled out all the stops, but it wasn't enough for the televote. But remember, if we'd had juries in the semis, could they have qualified? I think they definitely would have had more of a shot. I think Serbia getting through was largely, um, I think Serbia was lucky that the, the juries were not taking part in the semis. And I think that it really screwed the Netherlands. I'm not sure about Latvia. I'm a little bit, um, Latvia is one of those where the juries, I don't know if it would have been conventional enough for them. Um, they don't seem to like that kind of genre of music. They don't like to push it through. Uh, so I, I don't know if that alternative rock thing would have worked for them, but 100% feel like the Netherlands might have inched through. But I also feel like having both Switzerland and the Netherlands qualifying might have been a little too much for most people. Um, and especially if Serbia and Latvia are the ones not getting through because of that. But then, of course, we've got Croatia, which was the other controversial qualifier. Now, I am not surprised Croatia qualified. Not surprised at all. Um, it's a Moldova 2022 kind of moment. Um, there's a cultural, um, diasporic, Slavic, Balkan country kind of thing going on where they just, they really ate it up. Um, bonkers sort of meme ability of it is something that snapshots really well to grab the audience's attention. Because I think the audience also appreciates when an act perhaps isn't taking itself as seriously and perhaps Luke Black comes across a little pretentious because he's taking himself very seriously. You can tell that on stage. But they're like, I don't get it. I, it's weird. This, but, 
But Croatia looks like they're just having fun. Look at these old men, you know, dressing up in wacky clothes and, you know, in drag and, and oh, they're making a commentary on Putin. Like, oh, yeah, we were, we're down for this message, you know. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of galvanizing things that I think worked in the favor of Croatia that sort of was in Corpore Sano's strengths last year, as well as Trena Tool's strengths, the, the Zidzijob, Zidzijob song last year. Um, and uh, yeah, what are you going to do? I'm not surprised it qualified. And all of the other qualifiers were, you know, obvious. I mean, you know, I was so relieved for Moldova. I was worried that Moldova, you know, I, I, I was worried. I was worried. Um, but I knew that Pasha would, would serve. I think Pasha did phenomenal. I know that his vocals were a little hushed at the beginning. It was hard to hear. I'm not entirely sure if that's also, again, just some audio problems that we were having, particularly with semifinal one. Um, you know, since I don't understand the language to begin with, I don't really mind so much when the look, it's harder to hear. Um, and I could still tell he was singing, you know, I could tell he was, he was, he was, it felt like something was off in the audio. Um, but then it kind of, it kicked up and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I finally am doing a sort of deep dive into Eurovision history. Um, and when I say history, I'm not going back that far. So, I mean, there's a lot of Eurovision to catch up on. Um, but I recently kind of fully dived into the 2012 song contest, which is kind of apt for this year because of Laureen, but also because of Pasha. You know, he is the other 2012 returnee this year, not just Laureen. And um, his song from 2012, it's so funny to think this is the same person who's giving us Shuarele Shiluna, because, you know, I see the similarities in the voice and his delivery, but I also am just like, he really just, improved in my mind in my eyes creatively so much over what he sent in 2012 2012 felt like an alexander rybach knockoff a little bit like it was trying to capitalize off that success with fairy tale it's not terrible it's it's melodic enough but i definitely feel like him going you know full folk ethnic um rave pop was the right move for him um, because it was just the right level of mysterious and cohesive. Um, and I was worried that it would get the Fulen treatment. It survived. It did pretty well in the semi. Um, it didn't even come bottom in the semi. So I was very happy for that. Obviously, Czechia, we knew that was going through. Vesna only improved with time. There was a point after the pre-parties, which I didn't watch any of those performances, but people were saying Vesna wasn't going to bring it. Vesna brought it. Oh, they, they just, the only thing I will say is the pink outfits, particularly the color of it, which I understand, you know, there it's about female solidarity, the color pink. It's a very stereotypical color to associate with women. It feels a little less progressive than what they're pushing. But I wouldn't say that the outfits blow me away in the same way that the outfits for the music video would. Um, they don't feel quite Slavic enough. I will say the long braids are what pull it all together. I think that that gimmick that they can use for the choreography really speaks volumes uh, and makes the whole image of sort of disjointed Barbie doll come together so much more, so much more wonderfully. Um, I just think that the, the pink color choice was interesting. It wasn't exactly what I would have expected, but they pulled it off. They really did. And actually I kind of wouldn't have had it any other way now that I've seen the performance several times. Uh, and they're just so hypnotic and well in, in tune with each other. Some of the best choreography I think we had, at least in terms of the way it was laid out on stage for us, the way they, they worked with the stage as a group, you know, six members that aren't a band. That's a lot of people to coordinate when there, you know, is a lot to, to look at, but they're very synchronized. And anyway, they did a great job. Um, obviously the big two, well, let's Portugal, Mimi Cat going through, not surprising. Um, it's interesting. Um, my mom kept commenting she didn't like that song. Um, it felt like the tempo was sped up just a smidge more than I was even expecting. And uh, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. It's it's fun, you know, Portuguese flamenco. And I think that that's something that we need more of in the contest. And Portuguese being sung in, in the contest is also important. We haven't had that in a little while. So um, yeah, Mimi Cat did her thing. Um, Laureen and Finland, Laureen and Kadria took it home. No surprise there. Finland, of course, carried with 177 vote points from the televote. Sweden coming in second. We have Israel in third place. This was all to be expected. Um, Czechia fourth, Moldova in fifth. Norway only at sixth with 102, which actually kind of worried me considering 
going into the final, I was thinking, well, I guess Norway is going to be carried more by the juries than to get into the top five, because it only it came in the bottom six, bottom five of its semi. Uh, so I was surprised that Norway didn't come higher. Uh, but then it got an amazing televote sc score on the final night, which bumped it into the top five. And I was very happy to see that. Um, Switzerland coming in seventh, Croatia, and then Portugal. And then, yeah, Serbia coming at the bottom. I, I think that that makes sense. And so, like, you could argue that Latvia and Serbia could have swapped. Um, so let's talk about Ireland, which actually did not come at the bottom. Ireland got 10 points from the public. Look, it's no secret here if you've watched my channel. I think that uh, We Are One by Wild Youth is an atrocious song, okay? And it's it's rare that I, like, use that word because I, I feel like it's very easy for me to criticize stuff. I'm not a musician, you know? There is something about that song that is so infuriating that I don't have any, I don't have any qualms about calling it garbage. The song is not trying. The performance they gave is not trying. Um, the vocals were a little harsh. There were moments when it didn't feel like he was fully singing and was re relying too much on backing vocal, which is a controversial thing that the contest has been allowing more of in recent contests. I think we need to roll that back. I do think backing vocal can be useful for some artists for certain things, but they cannot use it as a crutch. And I feel like Ireland was doing that um, I mean, he tried to really pull out all the stops with this gold uh, jumpsuit that was way too tight for him. Um, he was definitely going for some points there, I suppose. Uh, but it wasn't that flattering altogether. And I just think the song and the music video uh, are pitiful. Pitiful. I'm sorry. It's a pitiful attempt from a country that is just obviously not trying. And I blame the broadcasters. I blame the production teams. I, I'm not trying to pin all this on Wild Youth, but I will say the controversy from semifinal one has been some of the things that Wild Youth have said subtly or things they've liked on Instagram, sort of being a little bit of a sore loser. Um, oh, Ireland's never really given a chance. Eurovision never gives us a chance. I, I, I know that every country wants to qualify and goes in with that expectation, but I really think Ireland should have saw the writing on the wall. If they're really that shocked that they didn't go through, that I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> look at the other songs you're competing against and look at what you're bringing to the table. This One Direction throwaway demo is not going to take it. It's not going to take it. People are not going to pick up the phone and vote for you. Um, and you're lucky you didn't come bottom in the semi. You're lucky you should have come bottom in the semi. You really should have. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm being a little harsh, but seeing Wild Youth's reaction to it makes me sort of double down a little bit. Now, I will say uh, there's some other controversy that is a little bit different um, that didn't help Wild Youth with the public, at least as far as anyone in the UK giving Ireland some love, because I think it was more in the UK that this was a thing. Um, so one of the managers of Wild Youth made a comment on Twitter uh, responding to a transgender woman um, being arrested in the UK for attacking another transgender woman, which is something that isn't brought up a lot when you see transphobes talking about this because this was a flashpoint discussion thing for turf Twitter. And, um, you know, in the photo, um, it's an older trans woman. It's an older trans woman. The, the, the trans woman has recently transitioned. Uh, so the, 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 co the conversation around passing as a woman is, is a hot topic here. But the, the, the person who commented said something along the lines of, you know, they were calling out the uh, headline of the article for referring to the, um, the perpetrator of the crime as a woman when, you know, to their view, clearly was not. And I don't want to get too much further into it, but that caused a lot of backlash. And then Wild Youth fired their manager, or this person who was attached to their team, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure it was their manager. They fired the person who was associated with them on that. And then they got a lot of backlash from people who are a little more conservative and transphobic because saying, you know, well, he was just telling the truth and how dare you censor someone for saying the truth? You know, this is, 
not a transgender woman, this is a man in a dress, and all of these things. Um, and so Wild Youth kind of got themselves in a lose-lose situation because uh, they did the right thing by what most people, progressive standards would, would allow, because Wild Youth wants to promote being progressive and inclusive. But they got a lot of backlash for it as well. And the controversy sort of stained them a lot. So that's why I'm not so surprised they didn't come in the bottom, because they won over a lot of the progressive youth, you know, uh, probably in the UK voting, thinking like, well, you know, Ireland deserves some love, probably not going to get a lot. And they did make a very important stand on this issue. So we're going to send them some love. I think if they hadn't had that controversy, they wouldn't have gotten as much press and traction and people would have rightfully forgotten about them. Because after you saw the performance, who's going to waste money voting for them? I'm sorry. Who who on earth? I mean, Malta, you can make a case for even Azerbaijan, even Azerbaijan. God, I mean, God bless. Azerbaijan never stood a chance in that semi. Um, but, you know, they, I would have put them above. I would have put them through um, over Ireland, you know, totally. Um, they were cute. They were cute. Oh, they're so cute. They were so humbling to watch on stage. But yeah, Ireland was a bathroom break. Uh, and uh, the, the the bigger conversation around Ireland is, is a big one. They have not qualified since 2018, but more egregiously, they have only qualified once in the last 10 iterations of the contest, because the last time they qualified again before that was in 2013. So 10 years ago, they have qualified once in 10 years. And a lot of people argue that their song that qualified in 2018 only did so because of identity politics. It was a very much a gay anthem and uh, everyone wanted to rally around that. And I, I think that there's probably some of that helping it, but I also thought it was a sweet song, you know, sweet sort of Ed Sheeran light melody. And I don't hate that it qualified, but um, Ireland, what's going on? And then if you look at the songs they've sent in the last 10 years, I got to be real with you. I don't disagree. Now, there's a couple blind spots I still have in the mid 2010. So when I finally do my research on some of those Irish entries, I'll fully let you know. But from 2018 onwards, I 100% agree with their non-qualifier streak. Last year with Brooke Scullion, I would admit that is a little bit more of a case to qualify, but I still do not understand why so many people were upset I mean, I understand why they were upset because they like Brooke and they want a girl bop on stage. I still don't understand why people think that it was so egregious that she didn't qualify when at the end of the day, I still don't think those vocals were giving what they should. I don't think that performance on its own, the song itself was doing Brooke any favors. I went into this, I ranted about it in my last year's video. I don't want to spend too much longer on this, but that's rich and did not deserve to qualify. And I am sorry, that's the case. That is the T. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of the song. I'm not a fan of the song. And um, what are you going to do? So, yeah, Ireland, what are we going to do? Well, you got to rethink things. We need to fire that person who's been in charge of the uh, RTE select song selection, that broadcaster. I, I, it just, he has to go. Um, you need to send something that feels Irish, that feels fresh, that feels, or, classic but in an elevated way like voila by barbara pravi lean either in one of those two directions but this middle of the road you know eurovision of yesteryear that you keep coming like that you, you keep trying to chase the success i mean it's crazy that they have still tied now with sweden for the most number of wins but their last win was in 1996 i believe years later they're, they're just not they're not giving any effort they're not trying at all and I think Ireland has Ireland has such a wealth of musicians and history of music. It's just painful that arguably one of the most beautifully musical countries in the world is doing so badly at Eurovision. It just, I mean, this is the country of Sinead O'Connor and of Enya and Clanad. What's going on? <laughs> what is going on? Um, do you need to say, do you need to send out Neve Cavanaugh again? <laughs> do we need to send her? It's for you is one of my favorite Irish entries of the last 20 years. And um, I don't know. I don't know what they need to do, but they, they need to incorporate. I think it would be nice for them to sing something in Irish. I think it would be nice for them to go a very folky kind of ethnic route. I think that, you know, taking a leaf out of Ukraine's book um, or Slovakia, I mean, Slovenia's book or some of these countries that have really embraced that sort of folkiness, I think is, is, is the key forward. 
Um, yeah, Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. It's it pains me so much, but they really need to reevaluate what's coming down the table because they did not deserve to qualify this year and they should not have been shocked by that. So let's move on and talk about semifinal two. This was one a lot more open. I had no idea what to expect. You know, I was kind of going into it thinking, all right, get out the popcorn. Like I, I don't have as much stake in the game. As long as Slovenia goes through, I don't really care. I got to talk about Austria because I got to be real with you. Austria staging just wasn't doing it for me, especially the second time I had to watch it in the grand final. I wasn't hyped for the song. Um, Austria opening was an interesting choice. It wouldn't have been who I have chosen to open the contest with, but yeah, I, the staging just did not do them any favors. Um, it was distracting LEDs, um, not enough kind of synchronized choreography, memeability, memeable choreography. And I also kind of do also wonder if this was just a song that was never really going to work very well on the stage because it's, it's not acoustic but it's also not a full-fledged bombastic pop number. It's this middle ground where it has moments of beautiful choral dynamic, and then it has, you know, cheesy electro synth riffs, dance breaks, but they're, they're, they're not they're all relying on this catchiness that it's either going to hit with the crowd or it's not. I just think the crowd probably was confused or was not fully feeling what they were selling. It, it probably didn't feel like Taya and Selena were that engaged with the audience. It's a shame. I, I really just don't think the song was well suited for the Eurovision stage. I think it was great as a music video and great as an audio, like an MP3 file. But the way it was packaged and presented, I just did not. But they still came second in the televote. They still came second. I'm not terribly surprised. I am surprised that Slovenia was fifth. I thought Slovenia would be at least in the top three, if not the first spot. But Australia stormed the televote in semifinal two. Um, I'm not mad at it. I think Australia really impressed me. I was really impressed with Voyager's performance. Um, I also loved their staging. I loved their, their light work. Um, the mood on stage was very fitting for the song. Um, but the biggest and most egregious qualifier here is Poland. There's really only one spot that I really felt should have gone to someone else. And that was Poland's spot that they took from either Iceland or Georgia. Iceland and Georgia both barely qualified. I'm very disappointed uh, in the sort of what feels like kind of nepotistic kind of um, advantage that Blanca has in this competition. Um, she has no business being near the top 10 in the grand final. Um, she had no business getting so many points from the televote. I just don't understand. I, I, I guess it's just TikTok fans. Yeah, seeing a pretty girl do pretty girl shit. What else can you say? Um, this was the other sort of song along with Ireland's where I can call it garbage and, and especially in this case, I don't even really feel like I'm insulting Blanca because it doesn't even feel like she's that invested in the song. It feels like, well, they gave this to me and I'm just told to do the dance and I'm pretty, I can do this. Okay, fine. But Noah Carroll wipes the floor with me, you know, wipes the floor with me in terms of choreography. And I'm, I, actually, I actually don't think Blanca is a terrible dancer. I think she does do what she needs to do for a very mediocre pop song on stage. But this song was, this song should never have been in the final. That, that was the frustrating qualifier. Um, because I want to talk about Iceland and Georgia. You know, Iceland, I really saw having a struggle, having a hard time getting in. I just don't feel like the song, it's a lot of like belting into the microphone, but it's not a lot of melody. I feel like there's the ratio of like melody and belting is just a little off with power, even though I probably enjoyed the song more than I ever had watching that semifinal two performance. After I watched it, I was like, yeah, I put her through. I put her through. I'd be okay with that. And then we have Georgia. And I think Georgia had a similar issue. The song is too much for most people. I, I think that the melody probably wasn't hitting the way it should. The emotionality of it wasn't hitting right. The gibberish kind of uh, parts in the lyrics and ad-libs didn't do any favors for her. Um, I think it was a head scratcher for a lot of the audience. And so I'm not surprised it didn't qualify. 
but I still would have sent it over Poland. And so I really feel bad for Iru um, because given the song she had, I really put, I think she put her heart and soul into it. Her vocals were very strong um, from what I heard. You know, I'm not the best at always catching vocals, especially on a song like this, which it's a little all over the place, you know, in terms of melody and pitch. But um, I will say that I, I felt really bad for her. There's, there's some video I've seen on Twitter of her crying. Um, and uh, let's talk about another act who no one expected to qualify. But uh, because of his age, it's sort of harsh that he had to go through this. Greece actually did not come at the bottom. That goes to San Marino. Uh, but Victor Vernikos, um, I'm happy it didn't qualify. Did not expect it to. I don't think many people did. Hate the song. Really don't like the song. I, I'm sort of appreciative of the fact that he wrote it himself. There's some promise and talent there. There's some promise and talent in his vocal. First of all, it was like the Greece delegation was like trying to set him up to fail with that staging. Um, the outfit choice, he looked like Steve Irwin. Um, looked like he was going on a safari. I, you know... <laughs> I gotta be real with you, seeing their leg from a male, like their hairy leg with sock ankle socks on the Eurovision stage. I'm like, do you know where you are? <laughs> do you know where you are? This this is just not classy enough. This is not classy enough. You can't dress like that. You can't dress like that. You look like you're in everyday clothes. You look like you have clothes that cost $20 that have worn a lot and are a little dirty on stage. Like, no. This is Eurovision. You you got to be better styled. You got to look. I I I I don't want to class shame here a little. I don't want to come across classes, but you got to look like some money was spent. Okay, I I don't know. It's it just was depressed. It was disappointing to me. Um. So most most atrocious styling definitely goes to Victor. I'm sorry. I know that wasn't your choice. Probably, probably had some influence on it. Yeah, I mean, he got drowned out by his own, you know, backing speakers and the vocal was all over the place. You know, it, it was just, the song is just disjointed, um, melodically stale, not captivating. No, sorry, but no, Greece could have done a lot better. I was a little surprised Denmark didn't qualify, but I'm glad it didn't. Um, Denmark opening, I thought, gave it a lot of an advantage, but it didn't, it got six points from the televote, which also surprised me because I thought that he would be going for that TikTok and the, you know, rest of the world vote would have probably come in for him a lot. The young vote. Uh, he's got the Gen Z hairstyle. It's so funny. I was at an amusement park recently and I was like, I finally understand. It's like this, you do like short on the sides and then like curly kind of Afro perm on the top. It's like very big. If you, at high schools across the country, every male is rocking that hairstyle. And it's so ironic because Victor is actually high school aged and Riley is 25. You would never guess if you looked at the two of them because Victor, you know, he looks a little older than Riley just because Riley ages himself down with his costuming and hairstyle. But um, Romania and San Marino, mm -mm, mm -mm. zero points from both televotes. I, I, sorry, don't feel bad. Um, especially Romania, you know, what were we doing? I do feel bad for Theodore though, because if he had given a different song, he could have showcased his powerful vocals, his strong vocals. But what on earth was the choice of the staging with the lava and the the woman coming out and feeling up on him and, and just no, 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 no. This is the never, it was never gonna work for me. And I don't think it was ever gonna work for the audience. Yeah, everyone else, I mean, you know, Armenia, impressed me with the staging. I really liked the, you know, how it starts out with her with the, the projection on the slanted surface. I think that works well for her. I do think that she gets a little uh, overwhelmed by what Noah Carroll is serving when she does the dance breaks and stuff. So when Armenia's song gets up tempo, it doesn't really work for me. I think the song works very well when it's ballad. And then when the song starts to pick up, I lose, it loses me a little bit. Um, I thought that Albania, you know, did what they needed to do, did what they needed to do. They wonder, they were wonderful on stage, wonderful vocals, but Alika stole the show for me. I think Alika really blew me out of the way with her vocals in semifinal one. Um, so happy she qualified. I wasn't sure if she was going to, that's why I was worried like Denmark might take her spot or something. 
Um, again, I'm not surprised Lithuania qualified. I mean, Monica did what she needed to do. Belgium, I mean, everyone talking about this song being a flop at the beginning after the national final. And then Gustav just floored us, took us to church with his vocals, along with all of the backing vocalists who also were wonderful. You could really hear them along with Lithuania, that both of them did a great job in incorporating their backing vocalists, as well as the dancers that Gustav had with him. Um, I also loved Gustav's styling. I think it was the first time I'd seen Gustav styled well for me. Some of his other styling, you know, he's extra, so he's doing his own thing. I'm like, that's good, good for you. It's not really my thing, but you looked exquisite uh, in in your in your white suit with the hat. I, I was I was definitely in love with his styling on the night. Yeah, Slovenia. Slovenia was probably like the one that captivated me the most, along with Estonia out of semifinal two. Australia was another one I was excited for, but I was let down by the performance. And Cyprus, I'm not surprised, qualified. Um, his vocals, though, were questionable at times. But, you know, he's got a safe, memorable melody that is gravitating. Um, he's also very good looking. So, you know, his muscles got him through, let's put it that way. But I know some people would have really loved to have seen Georgia take his spot as well. Before I move on to the grand final, I do just want to talk about re that we had several performances in semifinal one and semifinal two. For semifinal one, we opened with a performance by Julia, the one of the, the Ukrainian hosts of the program. So we had three hosts, Julia Sanina, who is a famous Ukrainian rock star. Um, she opened up the show. Uh, and then we have Hannah Waddingham and Alicia Dixon. Alicia Dixon, of course, was on uh, Britain's Got Talent. She was a guest judge for quite a while there. So I had heard of her from that. I had never heard of Hannah Waddingham before. Forgive me. I'm probably a bad gay for that because I think she has some Broadway connections. Um, I, I thought they were a great. I thought they were great. I, I feel like the chemistry between the three of them was a little off at points. But I, I don't know. They were, they were, they were small, solid. I think Hannah was obviously the most charismatic judge. Um, well, she was definitely the most humorous, um, and she seemed to be having the most fun. Um, Alicia seemed like she was just doing any old red carpet event, and Julia seemed to be a little. I don't know. It, it sometimes felt like she kind of felt like she didn't want to be there, or she felt like she was a third wheel, um, and or she was just a little pissed off at the other judges. Um, I don't know. But uh, all three of them were great. You know, obviously having the balance between Ukraine and UK was interested to see how they were going to pull that off. In semifinal one, I'm trying to remember um, some of the interval acts. Well, one of them was Rita Ora, which I thought was just, why her? Out of all the UK acts we could choose, why the frick are we choosing Rita Ora? BB Rexa has just put out an amazing record. Though I think the problem is, is that BB Rexa is not... British. I think she's um, Albanian and American, whereas Rita Ora is British and Albanian. So I think that that is the connection there. Um, so they wouldn't have had BB, I guess. But, you know, anyway. Um, so yeah, I was I was definitely uh, nonplussed by Rita Ora's performance um, in semifinal one. I'm trying to think, gosh, I'm already forgetting, like, what else did we have I know in semifinal two, Luke Evans gave sort of like a history lesson. None of the interval acts really did anything for me until the grand final. That, that's all I'm going to say on that front. But coming into the grand final. Whew. All right. So loved the opening Kalush Orchestra um, music video to stage ensemble set. Uh, I still really recoil and get annoyed when people say that Stephania did not deserve to win and that it was only political. Um, sure, pol politics definitely helped Stephania win, but on its own, that's a bop. <laughs> that is how you do a Slavic ethnic bop. Hip hop done right for me, um, at least in terms of Eurovision context, because the song feels old and new, fresh and classic, celebratory, uh, sincere, you don't have to understand the lyrics. You just feel amped up. You feel like you want to march on the streets with them and and dance and, and express your Slavic so solidarity. You know, like I just, and the melody, I mean, let's don't forget they're good singers. They harmonize beautifully. 
uh, when they're singing Stefania. Like they they sing the chorus so wonderfully with the flute. Oh, please. I, I just, I could listen to that song on and on and on. And there were some cameos. We had Andrew Lloyd Webber on the piano. We had Joss Stone, a famous UK singer, sort of appearing uh, in different shots of the video. But the probably the most surprising, uh, and I was watching with my family, it was sort of sudden. We were all like, and I was thinking, I was like, is that her? Is that who I think that is? Is that Dutch? Is that Kate Middleton? Is that the Princess of Wales? Kate Middleton playing Stefania on the piano for a brief period of time in a palace. Now, I will say, I've seen on Twitter, apparently, in Liverpool, in the stadium, when that split, when that clip came on, there were definitely some boos. I won't say the whole stadium seemed to be booing, but it was probably a sizable amount. And I apparently had seen a lot of other people said at different viewing parties they had in different bars and stuff, like people were... Eurovision audience, like young gays, are probably not going to take so well seeing the royal family plastered all over Eurovision. But I understand why they did it. Obviously, they just had the coronation the week before. This has been a bit of a crazy time for the UK. Uh, so they obviously are capitalizing on that. Um, King Charles and Camilla opened the stage a few weeks ago. They went to Liverpool and they hit this button and, you know, revealed it. They also appeared, they appeared briefly in the Eurovision Liverpool commercial, the preview that they put out right before the beginning of semifinal one. So, you know, they're, they're obviously, you know, the UK is celebrating the UK, just like when they hosted the Olympics. It's not surprising that they're going to put the Royal family in there. But I mean, it is, it, it's going to be a little controversial. It's going to be a little controversial. Um, apparently, Zelensky could not make a message uh, during the grand final. It was potentially going to be an idea that he had suggested or something. And then the EBU ultimately said, you know what? That's This isn't the right place for that. It didn't matter because I felt like we felt the Ukrainian solidarity throughout, especially the entire grand final. I mean, it was so drenched in emotion for Ukraine. But what was wonderful was that Unlike last year, Ukraine didn't, I felt like, place somewhere that I felt like it didn't deserve in terms of public vote and jury. Um, and we'll get to that when we talk about the end results, because I was a little unsure where Ukraine was going to fit this year. So there's a lot of factors coming in here. Um, but it did not win, which was good, because I did not believe that, or even come second place, Ukraine had no business being in the top three this year. I'm sorry, it was just a fact. It was just a fact. Ukraine got their flowers last year doesn't mean we have to give them to them again this year. And, you know, because of the war, I mean, uh, we opened up with Austria. Like I said, um, I felt it was an interesting choice. Portugal got that dreaded second place spot. Um, yeah, the second place spot is the be is the worst place to be in the final. It's, it's a given. And, you know, Portugal ended up doing pretty badly. Portugal ended up coming in spot 23rd. They only got, I believe, uh, 16 points from the public second spot curse still going strong i wonder laureen would have probably been one at laureen or Caria would have probably been the only acts immune to it if they had been placed in the second place spot and then we flowed through the night we ended with the uk uh the very lackluster performance um we had a uh interval act of sam Ryder, who brought out brian may of queen um I mean, no Paul McCartney. Okay. We, I thought we were going to have Paul McCartney and Ringo. You know, Liverpool, when is Liverpool going to ever get to host Eurovision again? This is the time to celebrate the Beatles. I was a little surprised. I guess some people thought it was a little too on the nose for them to bring out Paul McCartney and Ringo. But I thought they were going to. We did get a John Lennon cover by Mahmoud uh, when we covered the songbook of Liverpool, which imagine is one of those. John Lennon is Liverpudlian, of course. Uh, which ended in Gary and the Pacemakers' famous cover song, You'll Never Walk Alone, which actually is from a musical from the 40s that uh, no one really remembers, but that song just like blew up. And uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers made it very famous in the 60s. Um, they loved the you know way everyone came together to sing You'll Never Walk Alone. Um, we also had Netta singing You Spin Me Right Round Like a Record, which I thought was a weird, bizarre choice for her as a song and she looked like uh spider netta is just one of those 
big question marks for me. I, I, I can't really tell if I'm put off by her or if I respect it. <laughs> I guess I respect her and her quirkiness, but you know, something about it is just giving off like, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the SHIT, but like what you're wearing is, what you're wearing is crap. You look like a joke in your, your costuming. Like who, who styled you? <laughs> like, is someone trying to make fun of you? Like, are you, is someone setting you up to fail? Anyway. Um, and we also had Cornelia Jacobs. Uh, so I thought that was wonderful use of her with the water effects and everything that, that was really well done. Um, they brought out, uh, a 1993, the UK act for 1993, Sonia, um, which I thought was, you know, uh, a great tribute to 30 years, you know, of a country. I've never heard the song before or heard of the artist, but great tribute for an old Eurovision legend. Um, I would have loved to have seen you know, some bigger UK stars come to that stage. You know, I, I don't know. Why couldn't we have had, I guess the coronation also was very lacking in big Europe, British stars. We didn't get Harry Styles or Ed Sheeran or Adele or Coldplay or Sam Smith or Elton John. Those are like the pantheon of British pop royalty. And none of them performed either at the coronation concert or at Eurovision. But instead, at Eurovision, we got Rita Ora, and we got Katy Perry, who's not even British, at the coronation. Which is a little, so it's a little surprising. I feel like the Brits kind of got starved of the opportunity to showcase some of their their own talent. Um, but, oh well. Um, yeah, Robbie Williams could have done something at Eurovision. I, I don't know. It is, it is kind of surprising that, that he didn't pull from some of their heavyweights and have them on stage, considering, you know, other years, we've had people who aren't even from that country perform, like Justin Timberlake performed in Sweden in 2016, you know, or Madonna in Israel in 2019. Anyway, um, I do like giving it to a lot of Eurovision alum, though. Having Dathi come back, Dathi from Iceland, it's wonderful to see them on stage. Um, and then we get the points from the juries. And, you know, I heard someone say this is the new bathroom break. It might be. But boy, did the juries make their presence known. I really do believe the juries were exacting some revenge about being shut out of the semis. I think that explains a little bit of some of the goofiness going on here. This is unfortunately, I got to be honest with you, this was when my mood started to tip a little bit once we started getting well into the 37 juries. Um it's a, it's a real shame because the one I was the most excited about, it had been rumored and then confirmed for the UK. Of course, Ukraine gave their points first. Um, and then at the end, the UK gave their points. And the none other than the queen herself, sorry, Camilla, but the actual queen of the United Kingdom, Catherine Tate, a.k.a. Donna Noble, uh, or the Dr. Donna, if you watched that episode of Doctor Who, but, you know, also a.k.a. Nan, um, <laughs> a.k.a. so many things, so many amazing, iconic characters in comedy gave out the points for the UK in the Liverpool Stadium. And that was that was something that really brightened what was otherwise starting to kind of be a little bit slightly boring, bleak and upsetting part of the show. Now, of course, the UK ended up giving their 12 points to Sweden. I was not very surprised, especially at that point. But yeah, um, let's break down some of these uh, ju jury points here. When we look at the jury ranking, so this is before we bring in the televote, Sweden stormed the jury with a whopping 340 points. Sweden received 12 points from 15 countries. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the jury was very generous to Sweden. Not super surprising, but at the same time, spread the love a little bit, spread the love. Um, but you know, what, what is sort of more surprising, what really shocked me was the amount of love that Italy got. Um, Italy got 12 points from five countries. You know, some of them were to be expected, like San Marino. Slovenia, Malt, uh, Slovenia and Croatia. I was a little surprised Austria gave them 12 points, but Italy, Italy was given a lot of love. And um, I'm just a little surprised if, if they want to go for a male ballad, why did they decide that Remo wasn't worthy of giving almost any points? 
um, you know, I, I, I find that to be kind of baffling. The only country who gave them 10 points was Finland. Um, Switzerland was not given very much. They, they accrued 92 points. Um, I did not think that Marco was that strong. It wasn't bad. His vocals weren't bad. But maybe, I mean, I, I will say, Marco was one of the bathroom breaks for me during the grand final. And that was part of the problem. I sort of was a little shocked because I assumed that Italy wasn't going to do that well this year. I mean, Italy has done really well with the televote, regardless. And Italy has done in history a lot worse with the jury. So why this year are the juries finally waking up to Italy when there's been stronger entries and Italy has not gotten nearly as much love? That's what sort of bothers me a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Marco, a little overrated by the juries. Israel, very overrated by the juries. Five countries gave 12 points to Israel. Now, I will say it is highly controversial uh, that Israel is even allowed to participate in the contest right now, especially considering the situation in Ukraine and Russia. A lot of people are saying that Israel is committing similar atrocities and war crimes that Russia and Belarus are, but Israel is still invited to participate. Israel isn't even technically in Europe, but it is still allowed to participate. They have, they have some points, okay? They have some points. I, I side-eye it a little bit. I also, I forget which country it was that said this when they were giving out their points, but there was a lot of mention of Ukraine and peace, obviously, from the jury. And then they award 12 points to Israel. It's a little bit like, well, what? <laughs> what are we doing? Um, you know, Azerbaijan giving 12 points to Israel, I'm not so surprised about. Um, same with Armenia, definitely not so surprised there. But Italy and yeah, France, I was none I was I was not very happy about that. Um Noah does do what she needs to do with the performance. I think that she executes the choreography so perfectly that regardless if you can't stand the song, you have to give that props. Um, I don't think she had a bad vocal at all. She was on top of it, like very well controlled. The breath work was amazing to control and not seem out of breath and very on point all the time. The staging was pretty pretty impact pretty immaculate so i mean is it surprising that it did so well it's not surprising it did well with the public i knew the public was going to love it but i was just a little surprised the juries gave it so much love um it came second it came third with the juries i believe second with the juries over one point so israel and italy were kept like you know hopping over each other it was like a, we basically knew sweden had an almost insurmountable lead of jury points by the time we were halfway through and that's what started to kind of get my mood a little soured because I was noticing that these three countries were pretty much soaking up all the points and hardly anything was going anywhere else. Um, so a few other countries that did receive 12 points, Belgium was probably the most surprising. Belgium received, I believe, 12 points from two countries, Greece and Australia. And uh, that was really kind of refreshing. That was really refreshing from those countries. Very unexpected. Greece giving Belgium their 12 points. Like, what? <laughs> the, the Greeks are probably in a tizzy about that. Um, but, you know, hey, all right. Thank you for not giving it to Italy. Okay. Um, so I was, I was happy to see Belgium do way better than I absolutely thought they would. Um, I was impressed. Australia also received two 12 points. They received them from Portugal and from Iceland. I was very happy to see Iceland um, send the love there. I feel like the Icelandic juries were truly doing the right thing. Um, yeah, Australia des deserved some points. I, again, like it's a song that at the beginning I would have thought, oh no, give it to someone else. But now I'm like, no, they deserve some love. I was very happy to see that Czechia did get a little bit of love from Switzerland. That was probably one of the most heartwarming 12 points that I saw. Um, I wanted to hug Switzerland. I was just like, thank you. Because it was late into the thing. And I was like, is Czechia going to get any love? Czechia deserves that. And then Finland. Finland did get some love, of course, from Sweden. Sweden sent their 12 points to Finland, as well as Norway. And uh, that's not too surprising. 
Um, I would have loved to have seen Estonia send their 12 points there. Um, um, they sent 10. And then I believe the only other country to receive 12 points was Ukraine from Czechia. Um, I expected at least one country was going to give 12 to Ukraine. Ukraine ended up getting 54, 54 points from the juries, which seems right to me. Um, I knew that the public was probably going to be what really boosted that song. You know, it was it was a little pitchy. I, I really actually, again, Torchy was another one that really... Uh, I was more sold on the song than ever while watching the performance. I really feel like almost every country, especially all the ones that qualified for the grand final, they just, they really did their thing. Like, I was so impressed with everyone's performances. There weren't any truly atrocious vocals or gaffes with camera angles or choreography. Everyone's performances were felt very well, well rehearsed. Everything was so well staged. I was just, I was really impressed with the full package for the grand final. I felt like everyone did a phenomenal job. But yeah, Ukraine, you know, it's not something I was going to pick up, spend money and call and vote for, you know. Um, Italy gave them the most other amount of points. They gave them 10. Um, so let's talk about some of the more criminal situations here. So the fact that Norway did not receive any 12 points is a little sketchy to me. Um, Denmark... And Israel gave them the most love um, with 10. But uh, a lot of people gave them under six points. Um, the other country that had a similar fate with the juries was Spain. Um, so Spain did worse with the juries than I expected. And that was really upsetting. Um, I felt like this was definitely a song that the juries were going to put a lot of love behind. The only country to give it 10 points was Portugal, which, you know, good for Portugal. Um, but a lot of countries gave it twos and threes. I was very confused with how Spain only managed to accrue 95 jury points. You know, it just didn't, didn't sit right with me. Um, and that was very upsetting going into the, the televoting re results. Um, I was very worried Blanca was immaculate on that stage vocally and I was just transfixed like my parents were transfixed the argument that I have heard which will be more about the televote is that it is not accessible enough of a song and it's too obscure and there it's serious so you can tell it's taking itself seriously and so people wanting to have fun at Eurovision are not getting anything fun out of it. They're just getting a lot of something, but they don't understand it. And the, I, the, the general discourse that I've seen is that it really resonated with Iberia, with Spain and Portugal, but outside of that, people weren't going to get it. And I kept commenting and I said, I'm white as hell. And I had no clue what she's saying in the lyrics, but I'm, I feel what she's, what she's giving us. Like I, I, Spain was one of the most, emotionally impactful songs for me this year. Um, one of the songs that had me the most excited about Eurovision this year, because I, I talk about it in my big five review, you know, the song is pagan and feels very primal, primeval and, and motherly and, uh, but esoteric and, and off putting. And, and it, it feels almost like an invocation to something um, sort of mystical, like ritualistic. Um, you don't need to understand what's going on. You know, she puts so much vocal emphasis on the AA and it's about showcasing her throat vocals because it, it's, it's a very like chest and throat song, not so much head voice kind of song. And she really belts it in such a phenomenal way when she does get to her head voice. And it has such interesting instrumental instrumental production. So. Yeah, I see what they're saying, but boy, does the general public have horrible taste. Boy, they get behind Croatia because there's, you know, men in diapers straddling, you know, missiles, and that's fun. And they're old and silly, and it's camp. And I get that. That's what people are more, they still don't understand what the heck's going on, but they're, they're, in they're entertained by it. They're not entertained by Aya. They're just slightly unnerved. They're bored at, at best, and 
perhaps a little unnerved. And you do have to remember if no one's heard this song for the first time, but even when I heard this song for the first time, it had an immediate effect on me. So anyway, I'm not so surprised about the televote, but the jury, what is the jury's point if they're not going to award things like Spain? What are we doing here? What, what is the point of the jury if you're going to not give Spain at least some serious 10s and 12s? I mean, I understand maybe this song not even coming like top two in the jury, but at least top three or four. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Um, now, France, on the other hand, people felt was another sort of like unfortunate with the with the juries and with the televote. Uh, I think Lazara was, I don't know if she was nervous. Um, the vocals were better than that package we got in the semifinal, but they were still a little bit, you know, I can see the juries being nitpicky and 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 docking her there. But you can't say that Blanca didn't hit everything immaculately. I just, oh, I feel so bad for Spain. And what sucks is, as I said, someone said, Spain's going to go back to sending Lavenda every single year. It's like, no. I mean, if you're still going to come in bottom place, whether you send Lavenda or AI, AI, can you at least just keep sending AI, AIs? I mean, Chanel was huge success for them. And maybe they want to go that route, you know, do the Shakira thing. I, I get that. I'd rather them sending stuff like Chanel than La, than than Lavenda, like Slow Mo than Lavenda. But I want countries to send avant-garde risk songs. I want countries to send rooted cultural, regional, ethnic songs that are serious, not just gimmicky and stupid. And the fun is fun is good. We need a balance at Eurovision. But I don't want countries after seeing how Foulen did last year with France. And then seeing how Spain is, I'm, I'm really worried about getting more Stefanias because people are going to be like, let's just send the safest, blandest song that the juries will like. And then probably the public too, as evidenced by, you know, what's going on here. But that's where Finland comes to upset everything. So let's talk about, let's talk about the televote because, um, yeah, if we looked at the juries, um, Germany got the least love from the juries. I mean, jury, Germany got, I believe, three points. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Iceland for giving Germany some love. Yeah, um, let's talk about Lord of the Lost because they came last in the overall contest and they also came last in the juries. When I saw Germany staying at the bottom, I got to be honest, I was laughing a little bit. I was laughing a little bit because I'm sorry, but Lord of the Lost is not a song that is going to get you the success that you need. Now, I will remind people Going to 18 points cumulative, which is still bottom place, but the fact that there were no Neil Kwan this year, very strong. That's an improvement. That is an improvement, okay? You didn't get zero points. You got 18. You got 15 from the public. A little surprised it wasn't more. I thought the public would have been a little bit more on board, wouldn't it? And I, have, I knew the juries were not going to be. People are saying it's the most robbed Eurovision entry, the most undeserved bottom placement. I haven't seen every contest and I haven't studied all the bottom placements, but that seems like a stretch. Now, I maybe it is. I will say this. I will say this. Sure, it did not deserve to be at the bottom. I am not a heavy metal fan. Lord of the Lost was not really serving anything that I found to be worthwhile I appreciate the styling. I do appreciate his vocals, but the song wasn't working for me. I can't get past the genre. I'm sorry. It's too much of a leap for me and my ears and my musical taste to embrace what Lord of the Lost is serving. Australia was a much better bridge. Same with acts like Blind Channel. Blind Channel was probably a lot less like heavy metal and it was more like pop rock, but authentic pop rock, but with like rap. But I 100% I am more in tune with those songs. And Lord of the Lost is just, it's too much for me, especially when it explodes with the growls. You know, I'm, I'm just, you lose me. You lose me. I'm sorry. I wasn't a fan of Hungry in 2018, which is controversial. And if I'm not a fan of Hungry in 2018, I'm not going to like what Germany's serving this year. But no, Germany did not deserve to come at the very bottom. Poland, what the fuck? <laughs> WTF. Now, Poland only got 12 points from the jury. That's still 12 points too much. Don't quite understand how Poland got some love. But 81 points from the public, 
why couldn't that have gone towards Germany? Some more of that going towards Germany. Now, Croatia ended up getting 112 points. So let's talk about the United Kingdom. May Muller. Yeah, this was not going to be your night. I'm, I Once you saw that performance, anyone in the UK had to understand that was not going to work. May Muller had a song that was competent, hip, trendy, well-produced, catchy. Not terrible by UK standards, though still not the second coming. I you know, saw some people doing a little too much about it when it came out on Twitter. I was always a little bit like, this definitely reads bottom five to me. Unless she can really pull out the staging and the vocals, this is probably not going to work. I don't think Mae Muller was well suited for it. And she just was not, she was not on that mic. <laughs> it was just not coming through. We couldn't hear her. And not at least until the chorus and when she came down the steps and was like a little bit more on stage. Seemed like she got more confidence too. It seemed she was very closed off to the choreography, didn't really know what was going on. I don't know if she was ill prepared or just didn't feel comfortable with the song and the staging she was given. I also think everything that was going on behind her was distracting from her. And I also don't like her styling. Yeah, it was just, it was not going to work. Um, so the UK coming second uh, definitely deserved. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it just, it's, it's got to be said. Um, first of all, you know, the host country always suffers unless you're Italy um, or in the rare cases, other countries, but uh, you know, the host country almost always suffers the following year when they host the contest. I know that UK didn't win last year, but they almost did. So don't get too bummed because of that UK. Okay. Just admit that, you know, you didn't send the best song and you didn't, the performer wasn't maybe best suited for it, and there was just a mismatch and things just didn't come together. Um, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Uh, Serbia coming down above them. Uh, yeah, Serbia. I, I'm, I'm fine with Serbia being in the bottom five. Like I said, I, I really, the juries obviously hated it, but the public did not... Uh, respond very well to it either, which kind of surprised me. But I also think Finland took a lot of votes from Serbia. I, I think Finland and Croatia took a lot of votes from them. Portugal, Portugal did really bad with the public, but again, not terribly surprised. I got really excited and hopeful because I thought, oh, those votes are all going to Spain. No. Um, Albania did way better than the public with the public than I expected, but, uh, you know, still ended up finishing in the bottom five. Um, Slovenia. If there are two countries that I feel the worst for, it's Spain and Slovenia. They have no business being as low as they are. Um, I knew the juries with Slovenia were going to be a little wishy-washy. They were. 33 points from the jury, but only 45 from the public. What's going on? Again, those votes were going towards Finland. Those votes were going towards Finland. And into certain, in some extent, Australia, but I, I don't think that much. Switzerland actually got more points from the public than I expected. I was worried that there might be zero points from the public and it might go to Switzerland because I wasn't seeing anyone saying that that was their, their pick, right? Like it just didn't seem like this was, I mean, obviously the juries, you know, gave it 60 points, but uh, the public gave it 31. Boy, he didn't seem happy though. But you should have been happy, Remo, because you did a lot better than I expected you to. Um, and then Poland. Poland came way higher than it should have because of the, the public giving it 81 points. Um, but I already explained, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's just the Instagram follower thing. It's hard to count. It's hard to combat that. Um, Moldova, I'm actually okay with Moldova in 18th. That's better than I was expecting. I was really worried it was going to be bottom five. Um, 76 from the public. I was like, phew, phew. I was really worried. I knew it wasn't going to get zero, but I wouldn't have been surprised if it got like 16 or something like Mimi Cat did. And then Spain, 95 points from the jury, five points from the public. The worst public score. The worst public score. I don't understand. I, I don't understand. I, but like I said, people, there was, I saw some stuff on Twitter that some people said there was shady things going around with the 
voting not working in Spain and in other parts of Latin, like in Latin America, people were having trouble voting. Like, was the vote stifled? <laughs> was it rigged? I don't know. I would have voted for it. I should have voted. I really should have. It's just I was busy that day as somewhere else during the time when it, I'm in the U.S. So it was in the afternoon. And um, I didn't want to pay the money. Like, it's not free. I didn't want to pay to vote. But I should have. This is the first year the rest of the world can vote. And uh, uh, in France, I'm, I'm not, not so upset about that. Um, Austria flopped with the public. I mean, I, like I said, I really think the performance was underwhelming, but I was not expecting only 16 points. Armenia did about where I expected. Uh, Croatia, again, got boosted by that public score. Um, Cyprus was about split, you know, almost the same amount of points from jury and the public, 58 public, 68 jury. I expected the jury to be higher, but Cyprus than the public, um, but not by such a small margin. Um, Lithuania did, again, thankfully the juries at least saw the, the Lithuania through, because Lithuania could have gone higher. Um, Czechia only got 35 from the public. Again, didn't sit right with me. I mean, they still came in the top 10, so that doesn't bug me too much. Um, thankfully, the juries saw Czechia and the value of it um, to a certain extent um, and gave it some love. But again, you know, Spain, what, what's going on? Um, and then Australia, you know, 21 points from the public. I was kind of shocked that it wasn't more because they got 130. There's a big jump between Czechia's jury points and the Australia, the next one. Um, Estonia did 22, uh, Belgium 55, Ukraine got 189. Now I will say I was really unsure because the tricky part about Ukraine this year is everyone wants to give Ukraine some points. You don't want Ukraine in the bottom five when they're in the middle of the war for their lives, right? But we also don't necessarily want Ukraine in the top five. So I am very happy that Ukraine came sixth. They stayed out of the top five. I don't think it deserved to be there, but I also don't believe it deserved to be in the bottom five, not even really in the bottom 10. After the performance and with you throwing in some political sympathy votes, I was really worried that Ukraine, you know, was going to get an absurd televote score. And I knew it wasn't still going to win. I just knew that, I mean, Loreen would make sure that didn't happen, if anything else. But, you know, phew, yeah. Um, so ultimately I was okay with that. But then when we got Norway's jury points, 216, I was like, oh, there's some justice. I mean, there, I knew Norway would come through with the jury, the, the public. Um, I'm just shocked that the juries tanked her so hard. Really shocked she only got 52 points from the juries. I don't understand that, even more so than Spain, because Norway's kind of offering what the juries like. Um, Spain is, is what the juries don't love so much, but again, the juries need to be a little more well-rounded. They need to be appreciative of more diverse forms of music. That includes genres that I don't like, like heavy metal. I will be the first to say that. I can say that Spain was robbed, and I can also say that Germany was robbed from the juries because, you know, Poland getting more points from the juries than Germany, like what's going on here? But then Italy, 174, not a surprising score when you look at the public, but the jury of 176 being that, uh, that, that was weird. Um, Israel, 185, made 100% total sense. Finland, 376, the highest public score. Uh, if it was public only, they would have won quite comfortably because Sweden had 243. So, you know, a good 100 point, 120, 130 point lead that Finland had on Sweden. But Sweden ended up having the best numbers with the jury and the public. And, you know, this is how it's been for a long time. And I do, I will say this, you know, Lorraine still came second with the public. 243 is still a good score for the public. Um, it's the only other country to score in the 200s was Norway. So I, I, I you know, I, I wouldn't discount Sweden winning because Finland had a higher public score when, you know, the rest of the other public scores were way lower. Um, people were voting for Loreen, okay? People were voting for Loreen, but a lot of people were. I mean, people were chanting cha-cha-cha 
At one point, Graham and Hannah seem to have to calm everyone down multiple, multiple times. So at the end of the day, I kind of saw this happening. Just like Sasha Colby winning Drag Race in season 15, it felt like at a certain point we were watching the eventual crowning of Loreen happen almost ever since Melfest. It was just like the bookies were so sure. I think Finland doing so well with the televote, I think that's why people are a little bit, a little more peeved than they might have otherwise been. Because it's like we were all preparing ourselves for this. I mean, a lot of people thought Finland was her biggest challenge, but I think a lot of us ultimately did see her winning out anyway, just because of the juries. Like We knew how the jury was going to treat Finland. You know, they, to be fair, the juries actually did a lot better. That's the crazy thing. Finland did a lot better with the juries than I expected. And Spain did far worse. I, I don't quite understand that because, you know, you can make the argument that Carrilla's vocals... They're a little dodgy. You know, if you're a strictly, you know, by the numbers music guru, you might vocal guru, classically trained vocalist, you're going to be side-eyeing what Karia is doing. Um, he's not even really singing a lot of the time. But, you know, there's other ways of performing music. There's other ways of vocalizing. And Karia, well, his strengths are rhyming and rhythm um, he is impeccably on point with his raps. It's not easy to rap like that and be on time with the tempo and then also dance and do choreography. He worked his butt off on stage. And uh, his performance, you know, was sumptuous. We'll just say. I will say, you know, having the shirt off was always the smart move. <laughs> it was always going to be the smart move with him. Um, but, you know, everything about the the concept around the performance and him being the puppet master of the cha-cha dancers. It just was always going to be a winning package for me. But Laureen was also serving a winning package with the, you know, the, the screen on top of her and all the dramatics of the, you know. Is it better than Euphoria? That's a tough conversation. That's a tough conversation. I actually think Tattoo has strengths that Euphoria doesn't. I think Euphoria is so in your face with the melody and the production and I like that Tattoo is a little bit more insular, um, but then it explodes in a way that's very rewarding. Um, Euphoria sounds, oh, if, if Tattoo sounds like top 40 basic pop, I think Euphoria sounds even more basic. So I, I don't know. It's still good. It's well made, well produced, well vocally sung, Avicii-esque pop music, but uh, pop ballad pop balladry, um, Sia-esque balladry. But, uh, you know, Laureen, yeah, did she have some advantage from winning before the name recognition? Things come into favor, but, you know, she always was going to be the jury's favorite. And so I know a lot of people are upset, you know, do we abolish the juries? Do we bring juries back into the semifinals? Like, where's the path forward here? Not that I have any influence, but I, I've seen a lot of people say that I do think maybe decreasing the weight of the juries just a bit to give the public a little bit more of uh, that percentage of the total score might be the way forward. It just would help assuage perhaps the striking gulf of, you know, difference in points here. The other big issue that, I mean, a lot of people are pointing out is that when you look at the public breakdown of the scoring, no countries gave Sweden 12 points, um, which means no country viewed Sweden as their number one when it came to the amount of points that were going to be given. If you look at the public scores, the most the public ever gives Sweden is 10th place um, from, you know, particularly Malta, Estonia, Albania, Norway, and the Netherlands. Those are the countries that have the highest percentage of voters for. But if you look at uh, Finland, um, the public gave 12 points from Sweden to Finland, and Norway gave 12 points from Sweden. I mean, that's how it's, you know, um, the math is kind of complicated to how they get to that number. But um, yeah, no country put Sweden in their top spot. Um, they only ever put it second. And uh, yeah, that's 
that's a little problematic when you think about like the, the nature of this contest and who's it for. And I do just think that when we look at the juries, we need a little bit more transparency. We need maybe to expand the number of people or the difference, the, the, the musical tastes or experience of music and, you know, listening. Um, because just basic pop is four on the floor pop is not, you know, what Eurovision should just solely be about. We need all genres. We need different genres to do well with the juries and people to recognize that strength that can be there, even if it's, you know, like if the if the juries are a more well balanced representative of musical experts from different genres, um, we might have uh, different genres do better, and I think that's important. So we need to reform the juries, and perhaps maybe we could lower. You know, for example, juries can only give maybe instead of twelve points, they can only give up to six points, um, so that you know the public can still give up to twelve points, but the juries can only give six. So that that de decreases by half the um that fifth that you know 50 percent uh you know instead of 50 50 it's 75 25 somewhat more um you know that that could um be a little bit more more fair i don't know what the way forward is i Ma martin osterdahl has floated the idea of eliminating juries altogether for the final and um you know, that would have helped Finland in this case. But, you know, I, I also think that if we do that long term, we might start seeing mm, quality dip with some of the winners. You know, I do think the juries help get us our Duncan Lawrence's and our Salvador Sobral's. So I, I, how do we balance this? How do we balance this? I'm not sure. It's a tricky question. But at the end of the day, I would have liked to have seen Finland win. I feel like Finland win winning would have, it would have been like a monoskin win. It would have felt like an upset over the jury. It would have been like a middle finger to the jury in a way. And it would have been satisfying in that way. Um, Sweden winning is predictable and Sweden hosting is predictable. You know, um, I believe Finland has won before. Correct me if I'm wrong, but certainly not in the last 30 years. Um, and if they, I'm not sure, I think they have one before, but um, it's been a long time if they have. Uh, it would have been really interesting to see the country, a different country host, but you know, next year is going to be the ABBA 50th anniversary. So I saw a lot of people say it's a conspiracy theory. It's all a setup. It was rigged. They sent the safest entry to get number one. They hired Lord. They called Lorena. We need Eurovision in Stockholm next year, so you need to bring it home for us. And she did the dang thing. Look, Loreen deserves it. I think that Loreen. I'm still happy that one of my favorite top twos won. If you watch my original ranking, I had both in the top two. I had Finland just above it, only because I I think that there's a certain kind of DIY sort of raw power to what Karia is serving. And it is the perfect antithesis, similar to Moniskin, uh, to the jury bait dime a dozen pop songs that we keep seeing over and over again at Eurovision. They don't always win, but they're always the majority of the songs that we get. Um, you know, and, and it would have humbled Sweden a little bit. Would have humbled Sweden a little bit. Because I think Sweden is a little high on its own supply. A little too confident when they don't always send the best stuff. But they think they deserve, you know, like Sweden always qualifies for the final. You know, like they just, they're practically a big five country. Even though they don't always send the best stuff and they still get overrated to a certain degree. See 2019, for example. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I feel bad for Karia. He seems to be taking it hard, but like, don't come for him for that. He's actually being a real human. I feel like this is an important thing in someone's life and to come so close and then not to win, you know, you prepare yourself for it, but he's not trashing Loreen and no one is. I think everyone is just processing it in their own way. Um, Loreen is a deserved winner and she is, well, the first time she won, she was the first woman of color to win the contest. And of course, now she is the first repeat winner uh, that is a woman, but the second repeat winner 
overall of the contest. Johnny Logan won in 1980 for a second time. Um, so, you know, maybe this means that we're going to get more repeat winners from other years. Who knows? Um, but it definitely opens up. I think it makes it a little bit more enticing to some of them to say, oh, Laureen did it. And maybe we can again, too. Um, but even if she'd come second place, that would have been a phenomenal finish for her. And Finland did phenomenally, too. All the countries did well. I mean, it's just a shame that Spain, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I was in a real bad mood after that, after that result, particularly after the public, but also just seeing the juries and the way that they were with Spain and, and giving it all to Italy. And then, of course, tons to Sweden. In the meantime, you know, nothing for Norway, hardly anything for Norway, you know, very little to Czechia, very nothing to Lithuania. Belgium getting some love was nice. I, I appreciated that. But yeah, it was it was just kind of shocking. Really unexpected results, which I guess is good. It's not. But at the same time, it was expected that Laureen would win. What are your thoughts on the whole final and the final placements? Do you agree? Do you, did your favorite win? Um, what do you think could fix the contest if that is a thing that can possibly be done? Because I feel like no matter how they tweak it, people are going to be like, oh, this creates this new problem and now we're going to need to change it to sort this out. Like no one's, not everyone's ever going to be happy with, I think, the way Eurovision is organized. I, I feel like we do have a lot of say and we did actually get something changed. They were originally going to announce the qualifiers on stage, sort of like how they do on competition shows like American Idol. I'm glad that we ditched that idea. I'm so glad that by the time they actually did semifinal one, they ditched that because um, that's just unduly harsh. You know, we don't need to, that's Eurovision is a competition. And I do like to remind people of that. <laughs> Some people like, act like it's all fun and games. And it is, it is all fun and games, but I also want songs to be competitive. I don't want songs to just send crap because they don't care. Um, and whatever place you get is fine. It's like, no, you should care about what place you get. You should send good stuff. We should, I want to see every country step up their game, but some more than others, obviously. But at the same time, we don't take it that seriously. We don't want to see Victor Verna, you know, a 16 year old fall to pieces on stage because they didn't qualify. Like that's, that's not what Eurovision is about. That's, that's a little cruddy. That's a little, you know, that's not right. So I'm glad that we didn't choose that. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see what changes we might see uh, potentially with the aggregate scoring, um, if any, come next year. But uh, we'll be in Stockholm next year. Most likely Stockholm. It could be Malmo again. Apparently Gothenburg doesn't have the arena, at least uh, under construction right now. Um I have been to Stockholm. I mean, I know it's expensive. I don't think I would be able to go for it, obviously. Uh, if I go to Sweden, it'd be for other reasons, probably not for Eurovision, but we'll see. Um, but now they tie Ireland for the most amount of wins. I bet they'll usurp Ireland because I don't think Ireland's anywhere close to winning again. But I hope that Ireland can start qualifying again, you know, and then I hope that Germany can start getting higher than bottom one or two. <laughs> I hope Germany can like, but also send a, a song that deserves it. <laughs> I don't want them to send a bad song and it still get a weird score like Poland, for example. Poland did way better than it should have. So with all that being said, those are my thoughts. I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed day. I will see you all in my next video. Peace, love, and light. Bye.